College football fans, what up? It's the one and only Cole Thompson here. And to some of you, I'm a fresh new face. And that's okay. Because you want to know what? Today's subject is fresh faces, new places. Over a thousand players entered the transfer portal following the season's conclusion. And then last month, we saw a handful of other names enter the portal. Well, several of these high-profile figures might be the reason why a team or two is actually competing in the month of November for a spot in the college football playoff. And I figured today, we go through some of the more prominent names or the players that I'm most excited to see at their new locations heading into 2024. But if you're new here, welcome on into the channel. Make sure that you hit the comment section down below, which is one player you are excited to see in 2024. Make sure you like the video and hit subscribe, people, because... We're talking college football every single day leading up to the chaotic craziness that will be the dozen dance college football playoff of 2024. Make sure that you tell your friends, your family, your mortal enemies, best of bros, college football aficionados everywhere about this channel because we're not just on the race to become the number one YouTube show talking about our favorite sport, but we're on the race to become the number one college football community right here on YouTube. Make sure that you're following me on social media, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, really wherever you go ahead and have social media. It's the exact same as my YouTube handle, at Mr. Cole Thompson. So when you hit subscribe here, just go on over to the other app, and hit follow there. And if you want a question read live on air, guys, I love interacting with fans. I love interacting with this community. Make sure you email me at coltompsonwriting at gmail.com or slide in the DMs on Twitter, whatever we can do to keep this conversation rolling. So this is going to be a really interesting subject matter because if there's over... 2,000 names that I could have picked from. And this also includes, of course, the fresh faces that are coming on in from the 2024 recruiting class. The only limitations that I had was you had to leave your school. You had to go from some other location to this new place. So a guy like Nico Iamaliava, I'm very excited to see what he can bring to the table. I'm very excited to see what Jackson Arnold can bring to the table in Oklahoma. But they've been at the same location. We're just waiting for them to get their opportunity to start I'm not going to go ahead and put them on this list, but I am going to put Cam Ward on this list for Miami. I think it's abundantly clear that this is probably the biggest and brightest star that is going to reside in the ACC this year in terms of hit or miss prospects. Because you look at what Miami has been doing over the last three seasons, laying down a foundation, understanding that they're trying to build a recruiting ranks and then actually scour the transfer portal. And they went out and they swung big and they got Cam Ward. Ward was going to go to the pros. He decided, you know what? Coral Gables, NIL, I have another shot to better my odds to become one of the top quarterback prospects in 2025. Let's go ahead and sign on. He looked great in the spring game. He looked absolutely in sync with Xavier Renstro. He looked great when it came behind the offensive line, a much more improved offensive line. And they recently added in two new players that I think are going to elevate this offense even more so with Damian Martinez, the running back from Oregon State. And then you also bring in Sam Brown, who already has an understanding of Shannon Dawson's offense from his time in Houston. And I think this is a really good fit in terms of offensive personnel for a guy in Cam Ward. This is where you're going to see him go through his progressions, read the field, be able to, I think, take a step up in the pocket and deliver a clean strike down the field for a big time gain. You know, he's got a little bit of mobility. The interception to turnover ratio, that's something that I do wonder about if that's going to play a major role in Miami's system. But I've said for a while Miami is going to be the breakout team of 2024. Uh, If you've watched any of these videos, you know how I feel about Miami. I think that they're probably one of the more complete rosters in college football. And I compare them to Texas. And literally, they were a play away from making it actually a reality. Where, yes, just like Texas, they went 8-5 and after going 5-7. and This year, they can make it to the college football playoff. And I do think that a lot of it hinges on Ward. You have a quarterback that you feel like is a better fit for your system than any time uh, Tyler Van Dyke could be. You also bring over a ton of talent and you have a much more nuanced, seasoned, and mature offensive line. You went out and added in some key defensive players as well. But to me, it starts and ends with the quarterback. If Ward hits... What's the persona around Miami at this point? Well, they're a team that probably underachieved for the first two years with a guy that truly emulates everything about the Hurricanes culture. But now they have a baseline. And kids are going to start seeing that and say, well, the U is on the come up. I know that I can go ahead and carve out a role pretty quickly here. I know I can be a part of something special. They still send players to the NFL all the time. Yeah, I'm really interested. And if it doesn't work out, well, at that point, people are going to have a reason then to blame Mario Cristobal for everything going on. But in my opinion, everything that goes on in Coral Gables doesn't hinge only on Cam Ward. 
but I definitely think that you're turning a few games that were probably going to be toss-ups more so in favor of the Hurricanes going into 2024 than you did beforehand. Ohio State's Caleb Downs got to be on this list. Guys, I hope that you understand that this was the number one player on Alabama's roster last year. Yeah, they had some really good ones. They had Caden Proctor. They had J.C. Latham. He was a first-round pick. They had Dallas Turner. He was a first-round pick. Kool-Aid McKinstry, Terry and Arnold, Jalen Milrose going to be back in the Heisman race, especially, especially if he can have the growth the same way Michael Penix Jr. did. But there are very few irreplaceable players that I think you have to accept. Caleb Downs is one of them. And he's going to a secondary that didn't really need him, but they saw an opportunity and said, we will take whatever we can to fortify our back end and feel content at where we reside. To me, that's where I look at this Ohio State defense. And it's part of the reason I believe that it does feel like national championship or bust. This was a freshman that last year led the Alabama Crimson Tide, a Nick Saban roster in tackles. He was a true Five-star phenom. Not only that, he was a true All-American. He has everything that you want. And there really is no such thing as a negative spotlight about it. If you want to call out one thing, I think you would maybe argue that there are times that he'll bite at the double moves. And even then, it happens once in a blue moon. You hear people talk about him. They say generational. And nobody ever mentions a safety in the generational conversation because if it feels far-fetched, but at the same time, would you actually not imagine a guy like Caleb Downs having that persona when he did everything last season? Great against the run, great in coverage, was able to play at linebacker, was able to play at the linebacker spot, lined up really everywhere, never felt out of place. And now he joins a defense that predicates itself and prides itself on safety con uh, connectivity, on safety con uh, cohesion. Like Jim Knowles is a guru when it comes to that position. And now you're taking a guy that is elite in every category and just plopping them in the middle. You want to line them up in the, you want to line them up in the dollar formation? Go for it. You want to line them up in the back end? Go for it. Why not? You can do what you want with this kid. He is a one of one type of trade and it's very hard to find another player like him. So to me, this might be the number one player in all of college football when all is said and done. Nick Scorton out of Texas A&M. I got to see this kid live two weeks ago at the Maroon and White game. And all I will say is that if Mike Elko, who is a master at working with defensive linemen, can get the best version of him throughout summer, leading up to week one, Notre Dame's in a lot of trouble. Notre Dame's in a lot of trouble. Florida's going to be in a lot of trouble. Almost every single school that has to go ahead and play against Gorton is going to feel the wrath of his, of his anger. This is the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year that in the Bryan era does not know still, 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 how to play as a three te uh, as a as a, from a three point stance a defensive end. He was an outside linebacker in high school. He was an outside linebacker at college at Purdue, where he won the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year. He killed everybody. He just beat up on every single player. And maybe that's a testament to Texas A and M's offensive line, but maybe it's also a testament of what Scorton can be. And this was a kid that was still growing, going into his freshman year of college. So he's only getting bigger, and he's still learning how to play a position. And the fact that he is just able to overpower everyone that he has gone up against in practice, I think it carries a lot of weight. I, 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 I truly will not bet on many players to actually hit. These are a lot of the guys that I'm excited to see and what they'll do in their new teams. To me, though, Nick Scorton, without question, is one player that I will just immediately chalk up. I can go walk up to a Vegas casino. Hi, I will take him to be a future first-round pick. Please and thank you. Uh, staying with Texas A&M. Evan Stewart's a really interesting one. And Oregon's got a ton of new players coming on in. I think it's 14 transfers. Everyone from like Kobe Savage from Kansas State. They also went and they brought in uh, Derek Harmon from Michigan State. But Evan Stewart, one of the reasons why this offense was so lethal last year was not just because they had a good run game with Bucky Irving. It wasn't just because they had a mobile quarterback in Bo Nix. And it wasn't just because they had a 1,000-yard receiver in, in, in Troy Franklin. It was because they had two 1,000-yard receivers. And you never could feel comfortable double-teaming one because of at that moment, you knew that the other guy was going to be open. And that's Tess Johnson. And Johnson is back, and now he is going to be the new number one. And Stewart, he was a five-star coming out of Frisco. He was an elite playmaker. You saw at times in College Station what this offense could look like. And now you have to ask yourself, was it just lackadaisical awareness from him in practice that didn't translate to the game on Saturdays? Was the SEC just a little bit too rigorous for him to get immense playing time? 
Or was it the coaching staff that wasn't doing its job putting in the work to build Stewart up? Because Stewart on paper should be a 1,000-yard receiver. Texas A&M hasn't had a 1,000-yard playmaker since Mike Evans resided on campus. It's been forever. Christian Kirk, my apologies. But still, this has been a quarterback that, I mean, this has been a wide receiver that could end up being just as good as anybody else. And he's going to be working with a veteran. I think that Dylan Gabriel holds a lot of the keys on what is going to be a successful or underwhelming first year in the Big Ten. But whenever you have a security blanket and somebody that you can turn to, it's really easy to go ahead and just open up that door. I think Stewart's that guy. I'm very excited to see what he can do playing opposite of a playmaker that many people already know they have to better prepare for. They have to guarantee that he is not going to have another breakout season because Johnson's already a threat in himself. Well, imagine now you have two of them just like you did last season in the Pac-12, and you were a handful of plays away from going to a national championship in the process. Texas, Bill Norton, this is a new one for me. This is a guy that recently just left Arizona and now is headed to Austin to reunite with Johnny Mason, the former Wildcat defensive coordinator, and he's big. He's a big dude. This is literally your Tavondre Sweat replacement. Six foot six, 348 pounds, probably can get up to about 350, 355 if you really need him to. And this is a run stuffer. Part of the reason why you watched Arizona hit its stride last year was because of their defensive line. It was because of their ability to connect on plays and their ability to create uh, cre uh, create limitations for any offensive system. They did it against Washington. They did it in the second half against USC. And that's in large part due to the ability to pressure a quarterback. What was the thing that worked for Texas last year? Their run defense, their rushing, I mean, their, their front seven, their defensive line adding in that second wave of pressure up the middle. And now you're getting that with another guy that can be that bulldozing, bruising defensive tackle in Bill Norton. Now, the question is, do you have another player that can come in and be as effective as Byron Murphy opposite of him? Because if as much as you want to say Ethan Burke had a good year, as much as you have high hopes for Trey Moore, as much as you have high hopes for the incoming freshman, Colin Simons, to me, having the interior pass rush just gives you that second wind. Bill Norton is going to give you part of that. Who can be the other guy that provides that next level of, uh, that next level of consistency that not only creates major, major separation, but also carries you to the top and probably gets you right back in the hunt of making a college football playoff. As year one in the SEC, for that matter. Ben Urisic, I don't know how many people have been paying attention to Stanford football late on Saturday nights, but if you are a Georgia fan and are wondering what is our offense going to look like now without Brock Bowers, go turn on film of Ben, uh, ben Urisic highlights from last season. This is a wide receiver that is, is able to make plays like a tight end. And he is physical, and he can block and he can do a little bit of everything. And I just look at how, at times, last year, Stanford felt like it was dead in the water, and then it would be like the fourth quarter, and the game was over, but you knew that at this point, you were just trying to feel like that you got a moral victory. And Urisic was the number one option. He fled the team in receptions and targets and yards after catch. I think he was second in touchdowns, if I'm not mistaken. Stanford had to go through a bit of a rebuild with Troy Taylor leading the charge. But to me, when I look at what he can bring, you're not going to be able to replace Brock Bowers. This is a two-time John Mackey Award winner. But when you have as many weapons as you do, Oscar Delp, Dylan Bell, Ryan Rod Thomas, you also brought over Colby Young, you also brought over London Humphreys, you still have Dominic Levin on the roster, you brought over Trevor Etienne from Florida. You feel good. To me, the tight end is always going to be prevalent. Listen, you go back and you watch Kirby Smart and how the offenses have run underneath Munkin, underneath uh, Mike Bobo. The tight end has been a go-to element. And to me, a guy like your Sarek, who can come on in right away and be that difference maker, yeah, I am going to have high hopes on him. In fact, I would say you pair him along with Nick Scorton. They are just two guys I'm immediately throwing my hat in the, into the mix saying they're going to hit. I have no questions, no concerns whatsoever. Kansas State added in the hometown kid, Dylan Edwards. This just to me is fun. Like, I don't know what to make of Kansas State this year. I believe, personally, that they are going to be the biggest threat to take over as the flagship of the Big 12. I think they're alongside probably Oklahoma State. You're going to throw Utah in because Kyle Whittingham's not dying anytime soon. It doesn't feel like he's retiring anytime soon. But Kansas State, you got to look at their backfield. It's one thing to have Avery Johnson, a mobile quarterback. It's one thing to return DJ Giddens. And now you're adding in yet another human home run threat every single time he touches the football. And if you watched him last year at Colorado, when they did allow him to run, few people were able to touch him. 
at least at the line of scrimmage. He would get in the open field. He would boot, scoot, and boogie and find his way for a gain of six, gain of nine, gain of 12. You can do a lot with this offensive backfield in Manhattan. Like the Little Apple is going to be big time, big shows every single week because of what you have coming back. I love this fit. I love what I'm going to see from him as a pass catcher. You got to remember he had 36 catches last year at Colorado out of the backfield. Like there have been moments where you look at a guy like Dylan Edwards and say, well, here's the thing. We just need him to get first downs. We don't really care how he does it. And you're going to be content with that. And there's also something just when you think about storylines like QBU, everyone has their has their preference. For me, it's Oklahoma as of late. Wide receiver U, right now it's Ohio State. When I think of small running back U that is just going to pile drive and win Big 12 awards, yeah, that's Kansas State. Darren Sproles, throwing Deuce Vaughn, now you're throwing Dylan Edwards into the mix. I think he's going to hit immediately, and he's going to be a big reason why this team is trending upward. UCF's Penny Boone, the Knights. I know in other videos I have said the Golden Knights. My apologies. I was doing something with Vegas, talking about them on a podcast, and then I got caught with it. But the Knights... They are my sleeper in all of college football this year. As of right now, when I look at what Gus Malzahn can do, what this team could be, I can see them make it all the way to the Big 12 championship undefeated. I could. They can hold their own against Florida. They can hold their own against every team in the Big 12, and in large part, it's because of what they added in. You had Penny Boone. He was at Louisville for a hop, skip, and a jump. Now he's back in the portal. He's looking for a new place. There was a lot of teams interested in him, but somehow... Gus Malzahn, of all people, was able to convince him, come on down to Orlando, be in the bounce house, and be rocking and rolling with us for an entire season. And the crazy part is, a lot like we talk about with Miami, where they had to add in yet another element to their game, and they have a mobile quarterback. I'm not saying Cam Ward is elite when it comes to running, but he is mobile. But when you think about it, you had to add in that second gusto that would allow you to fortify your run game. That's why he brought in Damian Martinez. Well, you didn't have to do that when you were in, in uh, if you were if you were the Knights at all. You have RJ Harvey still there, but now you have RJ Harvey. Now you have a quarterback that does fit the mold of what Cam Newton is, and you've already heard Gus Malzahn say this: there will never be another Cam Newton. You're right, there won't be, but there will be players who can emulate what he did, and that's exactly what I think KJ Jefferson could do. And you were the one to teach him, and now you bring in Penny Boone, just run it seventy times a game. Left, right, center, go in the wishbone option, get defenses guessing. You're going to pick up first downs. You're going to score a lot of points, and you're going to be a team that feels like, yeah, we took the power five money, power four money, whatever you want to call it these days, but we also realized we want to be a team that actually can win a national title. Not this Mickey Mouse kind of conversation of, oh, yeah, well, we were undefeated and we were left out of the playoff as a group of five school. No, you saying right here, right now, we're a power four program. We want to act like it. Adding in Penny Boone, it makes the Knights that level. Nebraska's Dylan Raiola. This is the first freshman that we brought up so far. It's only one or two that I have on this list. Everything hinges on him. Everything does. Because if you look at this Nebraska team, their win total, according to FanDuel right now, is at seven and a half. And you're probably saying, well, why is it at seven and a half when they went five and seven last year? Well, for the last two seasons, they have been one of the closest calls every single Saturday. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's 10 games that have been won or lost by single digits. One possession has separated a win and a loss for those in Lincoln. And this is the best quarterback prospect that you have. It's very clear he's already been able to take the coaching underneath Matt Rule to heart. And it looks like he is going to win the starting job week one. How he translates over. There are a lot of good players at Nebraska too. The thing that really stands out to me, they have so many weapons. None of them feel like number ones, but maybe you just need three number twos that all can take over for one quarter a game and be that number one. You feel good about your rushing attack. I've been on record and I have been very boastful about talking when it comes to Tony White and his defense. I don't really worry about this team. Like everyone's talking about the spring game. They have like eight starters missing the time. So it's not that big of a deal. If you get Dylan Raiola up to speed, it's not saying that he can go and win the Heisman as a freshman. It's not saying that he can go ahead and win the big 12. But I think at this point for Nebraska, the only thing you're looking for, get the ball eligibility, show more growth going into year two under rule. And then in year three, as we've seen for lifetimes, wherever he has gone, that is where you finally hit your stride. If you get a quarterback that you now have for at least three years to build a foundation with, 
that's a good start. And I look at a guy like Raiola. He's already got a good understanding of what the offense is going to look like in 2024. Now he's got to be able to build off it. And with each game, gain that confidence a little bit more that separates him from every other quarterback that we talk about when it comes to the Big Ten. Justin Jolly of NC State. NC State, to me, is the perfect Tier 2 squad in all of college football because every year, you know what to expect. Like Penn State, yeah, you can probably say that they're also in that high Tier 2 squad, but you don't know what version of Penn State you're going to get offensively. You know their defense is going to be elite, but for me, with NC State, Offensively, defensively, they're still going to be nine and three, eight and four. And I really do like the addition of Grayson McCall, but you find yourself a six foot five target that can work the middle of the field and has proven he can take over games as a legit number one target, opposite of a guy in Katie Compassion, opposite of what you're also bringing in in the wide receiver that was at uh, Ohio State. I'm blanking on his name off the top of my head. Noah Rogers, my apologies. The fact that you're bringing those guys in and you also feel good about your rushing attack and you feel good about your defense, there's reason to have optimism. When you look at Jolly last year at UConn, he led the team in receptions, led the team in receiving touchdowns, led the team in receiving yards. And he did that also as a true freshman. And he's grown. He has gotten bigger from what you're hearing out of camp. He has looked really good when it comes to blocking. I think adding him in, there is a legit shot that we are talking about NC State. Their schedule. It's not challenging, it's not difficult, but there are some hiccups along the way. The one thing that will always carry a lot of weight is momentum. If you start gaining that momentum by having a consistent playmaker that is across the middle of the field, somebody in the red zone, we've seen this time and time before, I feel better about your overall persona. And to me, a guy like Jolly can be very jolly for a quarterback in Grayson McCall. So I'm excited to see what he brings. Last guy for you, Arizona Wildcats running back Jordan Washington. I just made a video. I'm going to leave it right here up above where I talk about Arizona being that team I'm most excited to see. And what I'm really excited to see when it comes to Arizona is how they're able to replace their talent that left in the offseason to follow Jed Fish to Seattle. Jordan Washington is a four-star running back out of, if I'm not mistaken, Temecula, California. He is really good. He is really talented. If you hear the way that scouts raved about him, his quick cut ability to win in the open field. And I think that you're going to need him to be a difference maker from the get-go. I'm not sure I'm saying that he has to be their exact replacement for Coleman, but if you can get yourself a young up-and-coming playmaker that offers some value, whether it be on third down, whether it be inside the red zone, whether it be as a pass catcher, just giving Noah Fafito one more element, that is what is going to make this team, I think, that much more dangerous. You look right now at where the Big 12 is, there's like a dozen teams that can win the conference, and I think Arizona is right at the top of it. I really do. You bring back Takario Davis, you bring back Fafita, you bring back T-Mac, you feel good about yourself. I feel very good about a Jordan Washington can hit from the get-go. This is a Wildcats team that probably is fighting more so for 9-3, and 10-2 and two than they are 7-5, and 8-4. and four. But let me know in the comments section down below, who are the players that you are most excited to see? Who are the players that have recently joined new teams that you think are going to hit? And make sure that you hit subscribe while you're here because we're talking college football every single day leading up to week one. Make sure that you're following me on social media, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Mr. Cole Thompson. And make sure at the same time you tell your friends, your family, your mortal enemies, best of bros, anybody that loves college football about this channel because we're on the race to not only become the number one YouTube show talking about our favorite sport, but also on the race to become the number one community when talking college football here on YouTube. Until next time, folks, I am Cole Thompson. And as the great Tom Petty once said, take it easy.